Hey everyone, welcome to Political Capital, your weekly BC politics podcast where we break down the latest news in British Columbia politics. There's always a ton going on. Thank you so much for being with us. If you're here on television, on Check News on Sundays, if you're watching us on YouTube, if you subscribe to the audio podcast on any format, Apple, Google, Skeecher, Podface. And McLean isn't joining us this week, so we're now on family-friendly podcast feeds, Podface Jr. We are everywhere that you need to be, and thank you so much for listening to us. So we're going to bring in the panel. we got a lot to talk about. Stick around for the extra audio content uh, later in the show. Panel, thank you for being here. Jillian Oliver, Green Strategist. Hello, Jillian. Hi. Katie Merrifield. No, oh, thank you for being here. Thank you for picking up <laughs> McLean's slack. Uh, McLean uh, is not here uh, due to some personal issues. Uh, we'll address his status when the special prosecutor investigation has concluded. Katie Merrifield, <laughs> Vice President from Wellington Advocacy, BC Liberal Strategist. Hello, Katie. Hi, happy to be here. Thanks uh, to both of you. There's lots going on. As usual, it's all within that COVID lens, which uh, sits atop all of British Columbia politics and causes all sorts of, of weird kind of changes in direction. And this week, we're going to start off talking about your passport to freedom, the idea of a vaccine passport. We heard from the Citizen Services Minister, Lisa Baer, this week that, yes, British Columbia is developing a vaccine passport, whether we have our own whether Ottawa comes in with, with one for all of the provinces, how exactly it's going to look. Uh, we're not quite sure if we even need one. It seems like we probably will to travel or go to a concert or something like that. Who knows? But we're working on one. There's also privacy concerns from the privacy commissioners that were out this week. Uh, how do we begin to get our head around a topic like this? Katie, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so let's start to let's start by taking a look at uh, public support of a vaccine passport. Leger did a recent poll, uh, and there's really overwhelming support for a vaccine passport specific to travel. About 80% of those uh, were in favor of that. It drops to 60 when um, when folks are asking, okay, well, should the government or small business small business owners uh, require passports? Uh, and then drops further to 50 when it's simply for, you know, entering a non-essential retail store. So obviously folks are are fine to have this uh, when it pertains to things like international travel, but get a little bit more squeamish when it's uh, for things that are a little bit closer to home. You know, I, I like what the Canada's privacy commissioners had come out and, st and said. They essentially stated that you know, there is a substantial public benefit here, but this is a significant encroachment on civil liberties. And they kind of outlined three uh, rules of play. It must be effective, the privacy risks must be proportionate, and these kind of passports must be decommissioned once they are, are no longer necessary or effective. So I, I like those those caveats there. I think on principle, I'm a bit wary of the idea as you know, it's, it can simply be a slippery slope into how governments uh, determine its use. But to be frank, when you're entering another country, you do often have to, you know, you have to present a, a visa to enter. You have to pr prove that you've been immunized against uh, particular particular illnesses. So if it's simply, showing an immunization card, then there is a precedent for that. And so mm -hmm. that I'm more comfortable with. What do you, th what do you guys think? Yeah. Jillian, like, does it, does it, the privacy or do any other kind of reasons give you hesitancy or how do you feel about it? Uh, I agree. I think the privacy commissioner guidelines are really instructive. I think that the government needs to be really clear about what is the public health outcome that these are actually achieving. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen a lot of information because they're still kind of waiting for the scientific information on how does being vaccinated impact transmissibility? If you're vaccinated, can you still pass COVID-19 on to others that aren't vaccinated like kids or can't be vaccinated for other reasons? Um, I think we're pretty much guaranteed to need it for international travel. There's lots of precedent for that, like Katie said. Um, other countries are trialing this. Um, I think the UK is trialing. They're doing kind of like pilot projects to see how they can reopen stadiums and theaters and these sorts of things. Um, Denmark has got probably the most widespread uh, use of this. They've got like a full digital passport that people are using to access restaurants and zoos and all kinds of things. So I think that the government, as they often do in Canada, are taking a wait and see approach to kind of figure out some of the bugs in the system and we'll probably um, 
you know, know more once they know more. Does it make sense for provinces to do this on their own? Or isn't it, I was just thinking like, it would be a lot better if just there was a Canada wide immunization yeah, yeah. thing that you show at the airport rather than Saskatchewan and Nova Scotia and BC all coming up with their own fancy little thing. But we haven't really got word from Ottawa that it's happening. So the government in BC said this week, we're working on our own just in case, which I, I guess makes sense, right? I mean, might as well start mm-hmm. working on it. But uh, mm-hmm. where are the feds on this, Katie? What do you think? Well, I think every folks want to move collaboratively, and it makes sense for Canada to to move as one entity. I don't think having provinces uh, with their own uh, specific criteria and requirements is really effective or efficient. Um, and I think Canada, government of Canada, is obviously looking to uh, other jurisdictions so they can align best practices with something as as sensitive as this as this. My biggest concern is that a vaccine passport could essentially develop to a two two classes of citizens right those who can travel at will and those who have not been vaccinated yet so i think they also might be ragging the puck a little bit uh until more folks have been vaccinated so they're not left out in the cold when a, an initiative like this is unveiled yeah and so everyone has a chance and once there's no yeah. excuse why you may not uh, want to get vaccinated then unveil the passport i guess have either of you tried the health gateway i tried it this week because mm-hmm. this was part of this discussion of our digital solution so there's a bc government health gateway you go on it it sends you to a, a smartphone app called the bc citizens uh, or the bc services card and you record this little video of yourself and it gets authenticated by a government agent and then your the app becomes your digital key to go back to the website, get your COVID test results, your immunization history, your um, uh, prescription drug history, your visits to your doctor. I was pretty impressed by it. I kind of thought in the long history of government screwing up IT projects, which is just (laughs) pretty much part of the course. This one actually works really well, and it's on your phone and everything. I, I don't know if either of you have tried it, but that would seem to make a lot of sense if you could put a passport on an easy app on your phone that's secure, and yeah. off you go, and you just kind of show it kind of thing, but I don't know. How long did that process take? Well, it I'm takes curious. a couple of days for them to authenticate your video, but once that's done, right. you can use it for uh, getting a student loan, the Canada Revenue Agency, your health records, there's a bunch of different things, so I don't know. If you haven't tried it out, uh, give it a shot. It's kind of interesting. We will see where this topic goes. More episodes of Political Capital are available at checknews.ca slash podcasts or search Political Capital wherever you listen to podcasts. Our next segment, the Falcon has landed. Kevin Falcon is now in the leadership race for the BC Liberal Party. Uh, We'll start with you, Jillian, on what you make of this. Um, I don't know if you saw his launch or not. He had a pretty fancy video. He's made a number of statements about things he wants to do with the party, including its name, kind of burst out of the gate. Um, what did you make of him and what he's saying so far and kind of where we're at uh, in this race, which still has nine more months to go? Yeah, I, I saw some of it. I didn't attend the launch event, but I saw some of the aftermath and watched his videos and whatnot. Um, I think it's still really early. Like it's very much anyone's game and we're probably going to see, I'm sure I mean, we're guaranteed, I think, to see more people jump into the race. Um, the things that stood out for me about Falcon's launch was one that he's trying to paint himself as not a career politician, which is like, I think a bit of a stretch. He obviously did take some time off politics, um, in the last decade or so after leaving, but that was only after losing a leadership race where he was trying to be, like stay in politics. So right. I thought that was a little bit of a stretch. He's, he's very, the reason why he's so well known and why he's a front runner is because he's been around for a long time. Um, And also the name change, obviously, like you mentioned, I think that that really speaks to um, how he is acknowledging that there might be some lasting damage to the BC Liberal brand from the last couple of years. Um, It's going to be interesting to see where that goes, because it is like it could could, you know, be good to sort of just rip the bandaid off and, and change the brand and go in another direction. But it also could be opening a can of worms because it raises a lot of questions about who is the party and what do they stand for and sort of opens it up to this existential discussion, which, um, you know, may not uh, reveal things that are palpable to voters. Mm-hmm. That name change mm-hmm. has come up in the past a few times. And, you know, the last time after Christy Clark won the leadership and uh, and then the election in 2013, uh, and it was always kind of viewed as, well, why mess up a good thing? You know, why change the name of a party that 
God has destined to win every election from now until the end of time. <laughs> and that's what it looked like for a long time. And yet now that it's not true anymore, the when the name change comes back, maybe there's more uptake on on having that discussion. But that and just kind of Falcon in general, Katie, what stood out for you? Yeah, so I wrote a piece for the Orca yesterday on on this. I think now that Kevin, the perceived front runner, is in the race, this kind of marks the unofficial start, even though we do have nine months to go and other candidates to join. Just Kevin's prominence in the party, uh, as well as the expectations from both his supporters and detractors, really marks the time that this race starts to get a little interesting. Uh, seeing Kevin back in, in media over the last few days, um, you know, I find it refreshing. I like Kevin's style. He is unapologetic, no nonsense. He's not a spinner by nature. Um, you don't really see a lot of platitudes from him. He's somebody who's really focused on, on outcomes. Um, I thought the launch itself was really well done. I was initially a little bit critical. They did a ready, set, go three stage, uh, like multi, multi-phase process. And at the beginning, I had I thought I missed a launch when they, okay. they threw up this ready graphic and was freaking out. Um, and then I, I you know, super second thought, I was like, this is actually quite innovative because it's really difficult to make an impact right now uh, in the media because it's so saturated by COVID and obviously opposition party, uh, et cetera. So I actually think it was quite interesting that they did this, this ready, set, go multi-stage launch. The uh, announcement itself was really professional. He was, Kevin was flanked by his family at a podium style announcement with very, very impressive co-chairs, uh, Puneet Sander and Diane Watts. Um, so I think at this point in time, it, Kevin is the one to beat. He got front page coverage. There was a lot of excitement around the launch. The NDP had been attacking him for months. Um, this is, is his to lose, but that said nine months is a really long time. And the higher you fly, the harder you can fall. So mm -hmm. it's going to be really critical how he engages over the next nine months or so. Yeah. And the NDP have been targeting him before he even entered the race. Uh, David Eby, uh, has a podcast of his own where he has the Falcon report, uh, every week where he talks about some scandal involving Kevin Falcon. The party had a bunch of, uh, releases out this week, trying to link, uh, Falcon to Maxime Bernier uh, with an old photo, uh, talk about some of his old decisions on bridge tolls and things that, you know, painting him as an elitist. And, you know, he is a property developer who happens to be, um, you know, fairly wealthy uh, on his own and successful. Um, but the, to the NDP, they've kind of seized on that continued um, theme that they've used in the last couple of elections of this is the liberals and their leader are wealthy party helping their friends and not you mm -hmm. and they're making your life uh, less affordable. I think it's interesting to watch that happen. And also Falcon stumbled a couple times on a couple issues out the door, uh, which uh, have been has also been interesting to watch. And I kind of wonder if you guys think I, it's nine months. So it was a long time. And yet um, it seems like already it's Falcon versus the NDP. He's kind of like the almost the opposition leader in training. Uh, in the way that this is handling. He's not fighting or criticizing other liberal leadership candidates yet. He's he's going directly with the NDP toe-to-toe -to -toe as campaign put a release out today, criticizing a week's worth of decisions by the NDP government. That's kind of a an interesting strategy. Uh, I don't know, Jillian, does it... Is that sustainable? Is it is it interesting to see if you were launching a campaign and in the very first week you have to take on not your opponents in the campaign, but your the other political opponents? What is what's the good and bad of something like that? Um, well, I think the the good is that it you know it, it sends a pretty strong message that he's the front runner and also that the NDP are concerned about him, which is you know when you're running a leadership campaign, you're basically making a pitch that you are like, you know, going to be the one that's leading the party in the next election that you have the best, because you have the best chance of winning. Um, so I think in some ways the NDP needs to be careful because that kind of helps his cause a little bit. Um, on the other hand, with a nine month long campaign, you don't want to peak too early. Like you want to be able to keep up a sense of momentum all the way to the very end. Um, so you need to save some, some tricks in your bag to make sure that you are able to kind of keep that sense going because people get fatigued and um, you know, the longer attacks go on, the easier it is for them to stick. Um, so we'll see. I think, yeah, I, I, I would imagine, I think because uh, it's so hard to break through the noise right now, like Katie said, that the Falcon campaign, and if I were them, this is what I'd be doing, is keeping most of their substance in their back pocket until probably the fall um, to sort of 
build that sense of momentum and make sure that the campaign has sort of a natural feeling of progression. Yeah, give people something to look forward to that policy debate, uh, if and when the clouds yeah. of COVID kind of clear. Let's um, we're going to talk some more about this. And you know, viewer, listener, uh, just you're in good hands here because you know Jillian ran Sonia First Snow's leadership campaign. Katie ran Andrew Wilkinson's leadership campaign. These are the campaign directors of the last two successful leadership campaigns in BC politics. So when we're going to pick this up in the audio podcast, we'll talk a lot more about this. Uh, stick around uh, because you won't get better insight than what we're going to discuss later. More episodes of Political Capital are available at checknews.ca slash podcasts or search Political Capital wherever you listen to podcasts. We're going to move on to the final topic of the week, though, and I want to talk about cruise ships, which, uh, I mean, this is one of these issues where I think we talked about it in the past. The Alaska wants to do its cruise ship season. Canada has a ban on cruise ships because of COVID. Alaska, there's this weird ancient maritime law in the United States that most modern cruise ships now have to stop at a port in Canada on their way to or from Alaska. Uh, And that didn't work in this COVID environment. So the Alaskans brought in a bill to change this temporarily. It's caused a whole bunch of political concerns, but whether it will truly be temporary, uh, Premier John Horgan brushed it aside several times and the Alaskan congressional delegation passed it through the Senate and the House this week. And they made John Horgan eat his words, uh, poking at him, mocking him, saying that he underestimated them uh, and wasn't helpful. It turned into it turned into a bit of a political mess for Horgan. Uh, what did you guys think of this when you were watching it play out, um, Jillian? It was kind of, as a little, I, I was fascinated by how Horgan became kind of a villain in the Alaska story. And, and the Alaskans very much end up trumpeting this as their own victory for jobs and tourism and a restart of their own at the expense of John Horgan, who didn't really do anything either way and maybe that was maybe that was his problem yeah i think i mean as a as a long-standing politician horgan should know that all politicians are very competitive and when he you know sent the signal that he didn't think the alaskan delegation was going to be able to accomplish this that that would light an even bigger fire under them and obviously they have other very significant motivations for getting this done so it was yeah it was pretty shocking to see i can't remember anything like in Canadian politics with a precedent like that, where you have a U.S. Um, member of Congress calling out a premier directly on Twitter and putting them on blast. It was pretty remarkable. Um, and yeah, I think it was uh, totally avoidable because when this first came up, I think the premier could have just said, we're looking into this. But instead, he gave a very definitive answer, which he didn't need to give at the time. I think that people really understand that these are really complex issues that we're living in really unprecedented times. Um, I I don't know why he did that and why they continued to double down as early, as late as this week in question period. Um, I think that British Columbians would understand that, you know, they are, of course, they understand we're already making a lot of economic sacrifices because of the pandemic. Um, so I think, you know, whichever, you know, if they continued to, to not permit uh, or to work with the federal government to not permit cruise ships that I think people would understand that but to not have any kind of plan or to not even be looking at it at all is really surprising and um, bordering on negligent I think yeah an unforced error Uh, Katie what did you make of this I don't disagree with Jillian's uh, analysis at all like now you see Horgan and his team are trying to spin this as nothing to see here and emphasize that you know this law is temporary until border restrictions are lifted but you know, he really undermined his own credibility by being so dismissive uh, up front on the on the possibility of this legislation passing in the first place. And, you know, to Jillian's point, when you have both Congress and the Senate gleefully trolling you on Twitter uh, about their victory over yours, you know, it means your, your comm strategy and diplomacy have utterly failed. Uh, so obviously a lot of work to do on, on that side. Where, where I'm concerned is the impact on the tourism industry. Like Ian, Uh, Robertson of the Greater Victoria Harbor Authority said, we have to take this issue seriously. And I don't think as a province we can play roulette with an industry that's worth close to $3 billion a year. Like this is having a significant impact on on stakeholders and and should not be dismissed outright. This is a big problem that needs to be rectified. And the concern that this temporary measure could become permanent is very much a real one. Mm-hmm. So. It, it, well, it is because one of the senators, he crack open a 100-year-old law that most Americans don't know exists that mandates stops in Canadian ports. And some senators, special interest groups, lobbyists look at this and go, what is this? And one senator from Utah called it a Canada-first law that should be scrapped entirely. It only benefits Canada. Yeah. That's exactly the kind of debate you don't want to have 
in, in the U.S. political system, suddenly it has control over a $3 billion tourism um, you know, sector, a uh, cruise ship sector for BC. It's a nightmare, but uh, somehow that is, uh, is where we ended up on that file this week, which is fascinating to watch. We only have a minute left here. I want to do a quick hot take uh, on going back to vaccines. It seems increasingly clear that British Columbians, when they're getting their second dose, will potentially have the ability, especially if you got AstraZeneca, like I did, to mix and match your doses, uh, possibly from one manufacturer to another, uh, go around the table. Would you do that? Does it cause any concerns for you? Would you just take whatever you're offered? Or how do you feel about mixing and matching, Kitty? Well, um, I don't have a strong opinion on this right now, but I haven't consulted Twitter for all the new doctors That's right. That's for their right. perspective. For the medical, so medical will, opinion, yeah. Yes. So once I get their well-informed, mm -hmm. rational recommendation, then I will proceed accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jillian? Um, yeah, Katie, maybe you can DM me once you kind of get the Twitter yeah. consensus. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I would, you know, I would talk to my actual doctor and if they said that it's safe to go. It looks like the emerging um, research on it says that it actually might be beneficial and at the very least safe. So I don't have any strong objection to it. Mm -hmm. Early adopters like myself who rushed out to get AstraZeneca, we're facing a choice of whether you get your second AstraZeneca dose early, potentially, because no one else wants AstraZeneca now, or you go back to one of the mainstream brands. Uh, so it, I, I don't know. I think I would take another AstraZeneca. But the, like you said, the science is evolving. You got to check with anonymous trolls on Twitter to yeah. figure out what the latest <laughs> medical research says from the journals. So uh, I agree with you. It's a, But it's a question a lot of us are going to face in the weeks ahead. What do we do? When do we want it? What do we want? Uh, how does it work? Um, lots of questions with the government's Restart 2.0 plan coming out next week as well. So we're going to hit on that next week. Thank you so much for watching. Stick around. Subscribe to the audio podcast for more content. We will see you next week on Political Capital. More episodes of Political Capital are available at checknews.ca slash podcasts or search Political Capital wherever you listen to podcasts.